us continue our study of certain correlative terms that have gradually come to be associated as terms of contrast. Tonight our pair is God and man. This usage occurs in literature, poetry, religion, and philosophy, and has come to carry some kind of a meaning, although analysis does not always clarify the actual practical intent. So we will begin with a consideration of the concept of deity as the first of this uh, contrasted pair of words. As far as we can tell, the evolution of an idea follows very closely the evolution of thought, of society, of culture, and of history. And in the development of the God concept, the pattern has been from the extremely abstract symbol toward a gradual personalization or personification until this became almost overwhelmingly literal. Then the process reversed itself, and by degrees the personification became more and more abstract until at last it was once more a virtual symbol. There is no doubt that our own human experience is responsible for this cycle, which occurs not only in the long-range pattern of religion, but in the development of various faiths, some of which did not endure for any great length of time. Still, they completed this cyclic pattern uh, within the province of their own sphere of influence. I think we must begin by assuming that God is a term for an idea. Deity is a concept, so far as man is concerned. But it is a concept about something which human experience recognizes as an inevitable need. The idea of God is necessary, at least in many periods of human evolution. And where it disappears temporarily, it is duly revived. But well, the original idea cannot die. Man has to have it. It is as inevitable to him as the term father. It may be that through circumstances the man has never seen his father. Yet he cannot imagine himself or experience himself as fatherless. In the same way, deity as the common father of existences is so real in our native and natural thinking that while we may constantly alter its form or revise our own interpretations of it, the basic fact or the basic element of the concept is as inevitable to us as the concept of our own consciousness. In the working out of this concept, therefore, we can trace some of the earliest efforts of men. We can pause for a moment and consider the dolmens, the great uncut stones that were raised in various parts of the earth, monolithic boulders, sometimes arranged in a rough design. Occasionally, more sophisticated patterns were created, but frequently just a stone, uncut, untrued, but usually of gigantic size, 
a sense of overpoweringness and a quality of endurance recognized or represented through the rock. Men therefore raised these monuments of rock to the principle which they could not understand. The rock itself became a complete symbol, entirely abstract, yet we remember it as the rock of ages. It has come down to us as the foundation stone of the entire concept of our religion. Gradually, men seem to feel the importance of working upon this rock with such crude instruments as they possessed to shape it into some kind of a likeness, to remove its complete abstraction. In doing this, however, they immediately fell upon a difficulty. What kind of form or shape could they bestow upon this? How were they to take this symbol and make it into a more particular recognizable unique device to represent a uniqueness in the eternal course of things. Man, of course, seemingly had only one solution to his own dilemma. In some way, he felt impelled to create upon this rock a likeness of man. Because of his own peculiar sense, perhaps, of an intellectual existence within him that divided him from the other visible kingdoms of nature, he came to the conclusion that the highest likeness that he could create was the human likeness. So we have a great unfoldment of anthropomorphic art. Art personifying deities in human form. Many modern sculptors would be well pleased with the, the earliest attempts at creating monolithic likenesses. The abstract features and characteristics would have been regarded as good art in the time of the rise of the Impressionists. Instinctively, man was only striving for Impressionism. He did not really believe that the power that maintains the universe looked like him. Some primitive tribes, perhaps, took the attitude that deity was only a ghostly father of the tribe. But even their minds were changed by circumstances. And little by little, man hit upon the humanizing of divine likenesses, the creation of the vira icon, the true appearance of a god. But as he progressed along this path, certain other difficulties confronted him, and some rather early thinkers have pointed it out. One of the difficulties was that the more this god came to look like man, the less it seemed to be like God. The uh, image resulted in a subconscious investing of the image with human attributes. As it looked like man, it became like man. Well, this was not the essential purpose. Our pious remote ancestors really did not want to worship themselves. This was not their intent. But some of them ultimately fell into this dilemma. So if they were going to create an image in the likeness of a man, they had to do something to it so that it was not a man. The first step, probably, was to invest this image with the highest attributes of humanity. To do this, the image figure could not be an ordinary citizen. It had to be a king. It had to represent the noblest of human authorities. And as the king was the ruler of a nation, 
So this divine king was the ruler of the world. We frequently find even in modern religion the use of the term king as a synonym for God or for some highly spiritualized being. The old terms linger, but we pass over them rather lightly. The king image is perhaps very well represented in the artistic uh, work of the Egyptians. Uh, the gods such as Seb, Ammon, Osiris were represented in the regalia of the pharaoh. In many instances it would be difficult to tell the deity from an earthly king unless some cartouche contained the proper inscription. Therefore we may see the deity bestowing blessing upon a king. And the two figures are almost identical, both in size and in the quality of regal adornments. By the same procedure, Isis, Nephthys, the feminine deities became uh, represented in the queenly robes of the Egyptian uh, regal system. Sometimes the headdress differed a little, but Osiris was almost always represented as Pharaoh of the North and South, with exactly the same crown as that of the earthly king. Now, by means of certain identifications of glyphs and teachings and popular veneration, the god and the king were separated in popular thinking. Yet the imagery does not clarify this separation. The same may be said of the Greek imagery. For the great marbles that have descended to us of the Grecian pantheon would indicate that the deities were of noble examples of heroic proportion of Greek sculpture. They were of the most elevated, conceivable appearances but they were fashioned completely in the likeness of mortals. And as a result of that, the Olympian heaven became more and more like some Greek state. Little by little, this humanization led to the loss of the larger concept of God's own dignity. God became as one writer has observed, merely a highly glorified Louis the Sixteenth. This was not the intention, but what could man do? He had no God image. The Tibetans, a very primitive people in many ways, hit upon one interesting thought. The best image they could think of was the world itself. So they created mandala representing cross sections of the solar system and these they regarded as proper emblems of deity. They could go no further in their own thinking, but they did outthink some other people we regard more civilized. The next possibility that occurred to man to divide his gods from his own kind was to alter the appearance in some marked way. In India, the deity might develop three heads or a multiplicity of arms, certainly attributes that are not human. In this way, a wall was established, and the god was no longer easily mistaken for a man. However, to most highly civilized people, uh, this, while symbolically helpful, was never aesthetically completely satisfactory. It took a long time to enrich human consciousness to the degree that the multi-headed, multi-armed divinity was really attractive. The early Christian church attempted the three-headed symbol of deity, but finally rejected it as not uh, suitable to the pious inclinations of devout persons. Another way in which the Oriental people and some other ancients uh, attempted to separate deity from man was by the color of the body. 
Colors were chosen which had no similarity in material existence. One very good color for this purpose was to gild the body, to create it either in an ochre yellow or in actual gold leaf applied to stone or wood or bronze. The gilded deity shone resplendently. Gold was always regarded as beautiful, if not always regarded as valuable. Some people never had much faith in it, but all recognized its adorning quality. The Hindus sometimes created their deities, particularly uh, Krishna or Vishnu, with a blue skin, perhaps to represent the firmament or some strange ethereal quality which made the body seem like a field of ether or of energy. Uh, this certainly helped to differentiate uh, this being from the ordinary mortal. The next step in this symbolization by which to add dignity to the figure was to increase its size. Size has always impressed man. He has always been deeply moved by great masses of things. Mountains touched his soul at a very early time. And he re reached a point where he simply reverenced the great snow peaks that might arise in the distance of his country. Thus size suggested might, power, authority. And images began to appear of an usual proportions. There are two great stone figures cut into the walls of a desolate region of Afghanistan, figures of the Buddha, nearly 200 feet in height, once gilded or polychromed, but now only shadows of their former glory. This tremendous size suggested the spiritual superiority the cosmic power of the sanctified figure. We still have in the East a number of very large religious images. The great Buddha of Nara, the largest bronze casting ever attempted, with its base nearly 70 feet in height. We also have figures in different parts of the world where Reclining figures, such as the Nirvana of the Buddha at Pegu, shows the great teacher lying on a jeweled couch. The figure is nearly 200 feet in length. There are images in Japan of Buddha, over 120 feet high. These images and those in other parts of the world, for they once favored other deities besides the Buddhist divinities, all represented magnitudes. The effort to represent the figure in some form that was so unworldly that even though it was fashioned of rock or clay or wood or iron, it still had about it a sense of mystery. In uh, early illuminated manuscripts, even among some early Christian and Jewish manuscripts, deity have symbolized is represented as larger than the devotee. And in India, of course, uh, the worshipper is a small figure at the feet of a great teaching image. This man attempted to abstract his symbolism, moving from one step to another, but usually favoring his eyes. He had no real way of interpreting his moods except by creating things that he could see. Later, when the civilization grew more advanced, men attempted, attempted to capture the divine symbol in music or in some other medium, but never as effectively. In early Christianity, there was a great objection to idols. And as a result of this, it was believed that religious images were simply the products of decadent paganism. Actually, this is not true. We have no evidence whatever uh, that at least the better strata 
of ancient peoples ever worshipped wood or stone. They were attempting to capture a mood. They wanted to look up upon something that overwhelmed them, that gave them a sense of their own smallness in the presence of something greater. In this way, they had the experience of the power of God, the tremendous strength that could bring a man to his knees. When Cambyses stood in the presence of the great Olympian Zeus, he gazed upon this wonder of the world in quietude for several moments and then fell on his knees. He had intended to destroy the temple and loot its treasuries, but he could not do it after looking upon the great face of Zeus. Thus the image was a force-carrying thing. But because of Western attitudes toward imagery of a religious nature, it has not been very frequent to see a deity or, or even other abstract ideas reduced to human form. During the Middle Ages, however, a number of great artists sensing the artistic possibility of this symbolism did create magnificent frescoes such as those that adorn the walls and ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Here deity is personified. He is shown creating the world, casting off the sun and moon, and raising up Adam from the earth. Deity takes the patriarchal image an image which is a combination of some contemporary sense of sageness and perhaps the mental image of Moses or one of the prophets. For most prophets or teachers, the creation of anthropomorphic likeness is not too difficult. Any person that once walked the earth as human uh, can be portrayed in a manner that will bring respect and acceptance. Most of the great pe people of antiquity, including the world teachers and, and great enlighteners of mankind, are known only by imaginary likenesses. The imagery has been created in an effort to interpret the power of the person, his qualities, his nature, his attributes. Some have been very clever in recognizing how perfectly the features and the proportions of the body can bear witness to the qualities of the mind and heart. As a result, some of these portrayals are masterpieces of interpretation. To go back, however, to the essential concept of deity, we realize that with the development of Protestantism in Europe, there was a tendency to depart from all religious images relating to the first person of the Trinity. Some images of the of deity uh, are still to be seen in all Catholic shrines and churches. Where they appear, they are nearly always invested with the abilities of the papacy. Deity is represented as Pope, as the Supreme Heavenly Father who is the parent cause and authority behind the earthly pope, who is his vicar in this world. Thus deity has the triple tiara, wears the full vestments of the clergy, carries symbols of spiritual and temporal authority, and usually makes the sign of benediction. This imagery was not carried into most Protestant denominations. As a result, deity became increasingly formless in the mind of the people. Deity became again an idea. But in this case, the idea was not completely self-sustaining. The idea of God, if not visualized, had to be put into some other medium of expression. 
We cannot think successfully about that which has no dimension, no proportion, no imagery that we can conjure up with our own intellectual, mo emotional uh, tensions. Thus we gradually came to substitute word pictures, definitions, and that which was no longer pictured came to be defined. Let us imagine for a moment that a devout person who has never been initiated into the imageries of deity may desire to contemplate the nature of the divine. He turns into himself in prayer or meditation, seeking to find some trace of the divine presence in his own nature. How is he going to find this trace? He cannot actually create an abstract visualization. So he simply talks to himself instead of out loud. He says to himself, God is good. He may never verbalize the statement. It becomes a thought-word uh, comparison or parallel. Consequently, in his mind, he thinks of God, and at the same time, he thinks of good. And when he thinks of good, and of wisdom, and of truth, and of beauty, and of love, he almost inevitably sees these words rising as terms in his own consciousness. They will come to him in his own native language. But he is substituting a new group of symbols. Symbols derived essentially from the meanings he has bestowed upon language. And in his meditation, he comforts himself by talking to himself, explaining to himself in unspoken but not unformed words the various aspects of the divine nature. This has become more or less the common practice of our time. And when someone else asks us about God, we have no way of answering their question except by verbalization. And in verbalization, we make use of those terms which in our own consciousness we have already identified with the divine nature. As time went on, this verbalization process, unsupported, uh, led to another difficulty. When men could see a likeness, uh, they fulfilled the ancient idea that to see is to believe. When the seeing was taken from them, when the images, imageries, were declared to be impious, then something of the reality of the presence of a divine power was lost. It had to depend upon the stimulating power within man himself. Human beings of different degrees of attainment had different abilities to stimulate such subjective imagery. Some did not get very far. Some gave up after a few tries. And others came up with definitions that were very little better than sacrilege. They had lost the power to simply experience the impact of sublimity. Religious art in recent years has not been especially good. And now that we seem to be plagued with modernism in religious art, it will probably be worse. And this does not carry the fulfillment of the essential purpose behind the training of imagination uh, to interpret symbolic embodiments. Thus, as man lost the imagery, he began to lose inner content uh, in contact with realities. The image terms that he created could so easily be tossed back and forth in argument. After man ceased to bow before some great created likeness, he found he had more energy with which to debate religion. The image stopped him. The concept behind some vast, magnificent design 
held his attention, brought him, at least symbolically speaking, to his knees in veneration. But words did not. He found it was easy to contradict the words of someone else and might be forced to defend his own beyond a legitimate degree. And what had once been a very vital experience ended in a debate. So out of this debating, uh, we gradually lost any direct contact with the God idea. And as materialism in general, somewhat assisted by this situation, by the way, took over, and men's minds turned to science and industry and other profitable professions, uh, the abstract faded out because it was not supported. The new immediate material world became a new image. Man having lost the image of the deity, rising triumphantly in some rocky arch, put in its place the image of the great factory, the office building, uh, the electrical plant. For his contemplations of deity, he began to contemplate chemistry. For actually, we are all largely bound to our visual perception. When cities became greater, men began to subtly venerate cities, whether they knew it or not. The cities became the realities, and the shadows of the old gods faded away. This was a psychological experience that some people might feel that the old imagery was sacrilegious. But these same people are captured in a new imagery, which is less idealistic, less constructive, and less solutional to the inner need of man. The individual who would never think of worshiping a god of wood or stone bestows an almost worshipful veneration upon his bank book. To him, it is a new security. It is a new symbol of the guiding power that preserves all things. And where a man's treasure is, there his heart is also. A man's treasure is now invested in physical achievements. They have developed the visual power. The great cathedral has developed a massive grandeur but the God in it is no longer visible. The great bridge receives the admiration of many people. Fine skyscrapers rising in masses of concrete and steel remind us of our own greatness, and we seem to like to be so reminded. But there is nothing there to remind us of that which is greater than man, and in this we have lost a very valuable perspective. Now let us leave this end of the matter for a moment and turn to the term man as it relates to this little couplet that we have selected. We do not seem to know exactly where the term or word man came from, generally assumed to be of Anglo-Saxon origin. But the Anglo-Saxons have been credited with many things that have later been traced elsewhere. Probably the word is tied to the Sanskrit or to the Persian, where it means essentially the thinker. Man from Manus, the mind. Manu, the lawgiver. In all of these terms, which undoubtedly could easily have come along the great Silk Road long, long ago, for this road was busy with traffic before the age of Pericles. In any event, the word man has come to represent collectively the totality of humanity. The human being as a kind of creature, a kind which is personified in each of its own members or each of its own productions 
so that the one man becomes the symbol of all men. And in the last analysis, the term man takes on androgen qualities and represents both male and female. It is the total of mankind. Though in ancient thinking, man had to struggle with his own nature some way. It was not only necessary for him to explain everything else, a task which he found most difficult. It was immediately important for him to explain his own nature, to find out what he was. He must answer the question, who am I? Again, most of the necessary information was lacking. Man found it just as difficult to form an adequate concept of himself as to form an equally adequate concept of God. Therefore, man and God as words both came to have much the same meaning, inscrutability. The impossibility of solving the primary mystery. The human being had thoughts, but he did not know where they came from. He has a hundred explanations for it today, but still he does not know. He has simply created concepts or hypotheses to explain himself. But no individual can really, honestly, certainly declare that he knows all about himself, that he has isolated his selfness completely within this strange complex of his own body. So in ancient times, man was finally regarded as an intelligent being inhabiting a body. The intelligent part might still be open to some controversy, but perhaps even simple human folks must be allowed to have their own peculiarities. Man believed himself to be intelligent. The reason he believed it was because whatever it was in him that seemed to pass for intelligence told him so. He was never able to get an affidavit from the being within. He was never able to produce that being in court other than vested in his flesh as it must always be during life. He had the feeling that this being came from somewhere before for birth and entered into the body, that after death this being went somewhere from the body, neither beginning nor perishing with the flesh. This being came to be a kind of shadow, a shade, a breath, a holy ghost, moving through flesh the very breath of life that it was said in Scripture, God breathed into the nostrils of man, and he became a living soul. So to man himself, his life was a kind of breath. Like the winds he came, and like the rains he departed. He did not know very much about this breath. He could not see it any more than he could a morning breeze. But as the breeze bent the trees and the grain in the meadow, so this breath in him caused motion in his body, gave him a certain existence, caused him to open his eyes and look out. Therefore, in a sense, it was as though this breath opened the eyes of an image. Now, this is a term used in a number of Asiatic countries for the dedication of a holy statue. In China, in Japan, Korea, Tibet, when the image of a deity has been made, either in wood or bronze or even painted, it is necessary to open the eyes of the image. This is achieved by putting something within the image which has sacred meaning in the case of a painting, an inscription upon the reverse may open its eyes. This opening of the eyes is the ensouling of the form with a divine truth of some kind. And in the, the, in the dedication of the great images of Buddhism and Lamaism, 
There were vast ceremonies of the opening of the eyes or the causing of the image to become alive. In Egypt, the shadow or form of things became alive by the mystery of the ritual of the opening of the mouth. Here, the breath, the speech, became the symbols of this al aliveness. The eyes and death no longer uh, had the power to see. The breath in death ceased. So, as man at birth first inhaled, so that life began by the taking in of air, and at death his last action was to exhale, which meant the departure of air. So the air came to be the symbol of spirit, and was regarded directly as such by the Inca of Peru. This man then was an ensouled body. Our remote ancestors seldom thought of man and his body as the same, or as identical, or that the soul depended for the, upon the body for its existence. Rather, it depended upon the body for its manifestation in this condition of existence. Man, trying to understand himself, sought to penetrate his own symbolism. In the beginning, he studied his neighbor, hoping in some way to observe in the actions of others clues to the majesty of the indwelling self. All forms of character analysis developed under this concept, such as physiognomy, the effort to determine appearance, uh, from appearance, uh, the characteristics of the nature. Also, man attempted through the collective expression of his kind, in peace and war, in the building of cities, in the casting down of cultures. He sought to discover in these larger general motions some clue uh, to his own larger purpose and destiny. It was all hypothetical and highly abstract, but man had no other way. He still has no other way. He has better words and longer ones. There are more authorities arguing the matter than ever before, and there are some very solemn pronouncements. But in the final analysis, man is not able to discover the self in him, apart from its involvement in the total psychological entity which he realizes to be partly true and partly illusional. He has never been able to separate reality and illusion within himself. Man then, in his dilemma, so to say, began to interpret larger things. And he sought by analogies to find answers, to, prost, uh, to questions that would not uh, be answered directly. The Egyptians, especially the later Hermetic philosophers, were very skilled in analogy. The great Hermes is accredited with the statement, that which is above is like unto that which is below. That vast things and small things are cast from the same designs, differing in size, magnitude, diversity of parts, multitude, but built upon one grand archetypal scheme. And while it didn't solve much, man came to the rather pleasant and comforting discovery that if he could solve the mystery of either God or himself, he would solve both. If he could understand God, he would know himself. If he could understand himself completely, he would know God. Out of this came many alchemistical speculations and a variety of mystical arts and sciences intended in one way or another to release consciousness from the limitations of prevailing attitudes and prejudices. 
At an early time, it was decided that bodily corruptions obscured inner vision, and we had the rise of asceticism, the determination to achieve insight through the purification of the body, under the belief that if we could refine the body, the light within it would shine through more perfectly. Many mystics have demonstrated a large measure of truth in such a concept at least for themselves and those who believed in them, they have found the answers that others seem to seek in vain. So the problem of uniting the concepts of God and man gained in the early modern time when science was still uh, rather overshadowed by philosophy, the belief that man could rationalize could discover himself by both reason and intuition. That not only were there things which science could not cope with, but would never be able to. Yet man was not left without some means of going beyond the restrictions of science, which was limited to physical things. This further step toward the unknown could be taken by the trained mind, reason. Reason was just as scientifically factual as a laboratory experiment. If the mind was trained and trained properly, its findings would have scientific exactitude. The danger was that the untrained mind, like the inadequate scientist, would be unable to achieve the higher purposes. Out of mysticism and out of reason and out of the ancient religious convictions of our forefathers and to a degree through the development of psychology and the extrasensory perception concepts of modern time, man is coming around again to the belief that there is some way in which he can discover more, at least, than he now knows about both deity and himself. He believes that he can carry this project further. And those who hold this belief also believe that this particular project has absolute priority inasmuch as man's future depends entirely upon his insight. If man is unable to clarify certain mysteries within his own nature, he can never lead humanity or society to any promised land that is fit to inhabit. To achieve this, he therefore begins his re-evaluation of deity and of himself. Gradually, modern man has either rejected deity or reduce the concept to a scientific symbolism. I think we may say that for the most part, science is building a strange, abstract image of the divine without really knowing that it is doing so. Atheism is merely a matter of interpretation of data. The individual who is not aware of the depth dimensions of his own researches may become agnostic or atheistic, but the whole structure of modern thought seems to be moving inevitably to the realization that deity is an eternal power ever manifesting through the immutable laws of existence. The immutable universe is emerging. Uh, the magnificent interplay of laws, forces, elements, materials. All these symbolisms ultimately sustain the existence of a magnificent scheme. And the universe emerges as one vast entity, one being, one principle, one life. And it is this vaster interpretation that now begins to provide 
a semi-visible vestment for the eternal being. Man has not really developed this completely in recent times. Some older peoples laid the foundations very well. The Brahmins had a tremendous concept of the universe. Their mathematics stagger the imagination. And while this pattern which they devised may not in its form or detail coincide with our modern findings, it gave to those who experienced it a tremendous sense of the infinity of life. The Brahmin knew that life went on beyond the furthest star in the firmament. And in old Hindu astronomy, such small equations as light years were only fractions of the larger realization of things. The Hindu concept of the universe went beyond anything calculable today. The details were not, are not advanced as competitive proof of anything. But we do know that out of the concept there came a tremendous philosophical vitality. And that in this way, Brahmanism in its older form and afterwards Hinduism before it was gradually corrupted, united religion with a scientific ex experience of existence which was unknown in the West. For in the West we were still worrying about a square earth with an angel at each corner. As we go further into this uh, same problem, we know that the ancients found a great scientific structure compatible with religion. And this is another experience that we are gradually coming to appreciate today. We are beginning to realize that the advancement of material knowledge does not sound the death knell of religion. That it only requires a reorientation of our interpretive faculties. We have to use another dimension of mental seeing. And when we do this, the advancements in science become merely further confirming evidence of the infinite plan and the power behind it. Now man, working with this problem, must also finally meet the comparison between himself and God. Man seeking God has been accused of a terrible arrogance. There are still millions of devout persons who believe that the mere effort of man to explain his own existence is little better than heresy. That the individual should recognize that God created him to be ignorant and expected him to remain that way and penalized him for knowledge. Religious orders in Europe, such as the Ignorantine Friars, a real organization, were proud of the fact that they preserved their illiteracy to their deathbeds. It was assumed that man could only get in trouble and endanger his eternal soul by exploring the universe. Well, perhaps some of the old fears were better grounded than we suspect. For certainly our primary and uh, up to now our achievements in science have not enriched our souls to any appreciable degree. And we are not certain that we are not endangering our own eternal life for the sake of the advancement of our material careers. Certainly we are not helping ourselves to very much toward greater happiness and insight and peace of soul. Man, however, realizing some relationship between himself and the universe, had some questions he had to answer. First of all, is man actually the highest product of creation. As far as he can tell with his own sensory perceptions, he is. 
That is, he is the highest product of a specialized type of life. He is not too sure whether planets are products or not, or whether suns represent beings. The, the human being measuring existence by the power to express consciousness through sensory perceptions, and to have a consciousness to express, regards himself as more or less unique. At the same time, he is not sure of this. He is not sure of what might, may lie beyond the range of his sensory gamut, and he is becoming increasingly aware of how limited this range is. It is quite possible that he is surrounded by beings greater than himself which he cannot see, and which by their very natures will never have any very intimate relation with his existence. But man, taking it for granted that he has achieved a degree of self-knowing by which it is possible for him to think more deeply and more truly upon essential problems, feels that this is therefore not only his opportunity but his responsibility. The more conscientious of our ancestors felt definitely that man had been given these faculties to use. And philosophy has told the world that the reason man can think is because he is supposed to think, and that in some way the process of thinking must contribute to his ultimate well-being. It's the same old question again. If deity had not intended him to use his mind, why was he given one? We cannot agree that it was solely for the purpose of leading him into temptation. It achieved that magnificently, but we are not certain that that was the intent. Man always has trouble internalizing his interests. It is much easier for him to conquer a city than to control his own appetite. It is far more convenient to explore the universe than to seek to understand himself. Also, it appears that he is better equipped to conquer other things than to subdue his own passions. He cannot cope with it, and he is reluctantly but inevitably given up. Against this particular point of view, of course, comes our Buddhist philosophy, which warns the individual again and again that both himself and his concept of the universe both arise only in his own attitudes, that he actually knows nothing about qualities of life essentially different from his own. The only possible way, therefore, in which he can know something that he does not know is to become something that at present he is not. The only way in which you can increase insight is to improve character. This was a mystical religious axiom of the ages. It is found in every religious book. It is found in every great teacher's recommendations to disciples that the beginning of wisdom for man is to correct his own faults purify his own life, subdue his own unreasonable attitudes, and escape from the dominating conviction that he must be right. Until something happens to this pattern, there will be no answers to the great questions, and the terms God and man must still stand in contrast to each other. In the Vedanta system, there is no such contrast. God and man are aspects of one reality. Man is a manifestation of the eternal energy of God. Man's consciousness is an extension of God consciousness. The individual within himself is identical with divinity. And the difference lies only in the degree of the realization of this fact. Between man as man 
and man as divinity, looms the menacing shadow of man's own humanity by which he is isolated from his divinity. To the degree, therefore, that man is bound to the earth, he is an animal. To the degree that he is satisfied to live an animal existence, he is merely a biped without feathers, as Plato called him. As long as the human being does not excel other creatures around him in the unfolding of character, he is not greater than those other creatures. This excellence must not be merely an exaggeration of an animal proclivity. Thus we find ants that build cities and great cones that rise in the desert. To an ant, these cones are skyscrapers. There are many, many times the height of the ant. And if we were to compare, we would realize why people standing on the top of the Empire State Building and looking down say that people below look like ants. It is a matter of relativity in this particular degree. But you can never build a building that will, that will cause you to break basic partnership with an ant community. You can never create a social system by which you will escape all of the implications of the life of the bee. You will never be able to develop the skills and speeds which will absolutely differentiate you from the bird, the insect, the underwater creature. Everywhere in nature we see various superlatives, strength, cunning, sense. Man, uh, isolated in a forest, is hopelessly lost. A bird carried hundreds of miles from its home, will unerringly return there. Dogs that have been taken away from families or have been left behind by families have traveled hundreds of miles over unknown terrain and gone home. Man cannot do this. He is hopelessly outmaneuvered in instincts and intuitions by creatures that he has not very much respect for. Therefore, what is it by which man is uniquely entitled to consider himself uh, capable of discovering or experiencing truth? First of all, it is because man, perhaps, we are not sure, but we think it possible, is the only creature that can estimate itself it is the only creature capable of turning into itself and asking the question, who am I? This is the beginning of man's great journey. For his entire progress has been a desperate searching after elusive answers. In the Eastern philosophy, there is in man a principle which is called the Atman. This is one with the infinite life, consciousness, love, truth, wisdom of space. The Atman is everywhere. It is the God of things and the God in things. It extends throughout infinity. It is able to fill spaces where even the lights of cosmic suns cannot reach. There is no conceivable boundary to it. And no matter how far we travel into infinity, we can never hope to reach the edge of the Atman. This is the all-pervading and it is the one source of what we may term existence. 
it is the ever fruitful. It is what the Egyptians called the seminal power of space, filled with seed. And these seed itself, of its own nature and of its own kind. Creation is a great field in which these tiny seeds fall into the dark earth of matter and grow up again and are fruitful and replenish the earth. Everything is Atman. Everything is life. And this Atman has the only ultimate perfection we can conceive of. We do not know whether it is conscious or not, but we know that consciousness arises in it. We do not know whether it thinks or not, but it can bestow thought. We are not concerned too much whether it moves or not, because it is the source of motion. We are not sure whether it is light or darkness, but we know that the darkness of it is full of light. We know that it is infinite life, infinitely manifesting. We know that it creates, preserves, and finally absorbs all things into itself. It fashions and nourishes that which it fashions. It is being and food and place and time. It is impossible for us in this stage of our evolution to experience the actual essential life of the Atman. We cannot know all that it is, because the only conceivable thing that can know all is the Atman itself. Whether this Atman knows all else but itself, or knows only itself, or has no knowledge of either, or knows both, these questions are unanswerable by man. But the hypothesis or the concept of the Atman alone meets to the Vedantic thinker the absolute minimum requirement of what it is that is at the root of existence. Nothing less can explain all things. And when you have to leave some things out of an explanation, it also means that you must leave some men out of redemption. The next thing, then, is that this Atman, in some form, pervades all life and is the life in life. That those creatures that do not know this are still pervaded by it so that everything that exists is of one essential quality, differing in degrees of manifestation, but identical in eternal substance. To hold this thought, then, as the Swami Vivekananda points out, is to immediately accept the ethical responsibility of the ultimate and, and inevitable brotherhood of all that lives. All things which arise from the same parental cause must be considered brothers. Furthermore, in this cause there is no essential demarcation between forms of life. Demarcation is created by body not in life itself. We have no proof, therefore, in the Vedantic thinking, that the Atman in one person is separate from the Atman in another. To assume se such separateness is also to assume that every unit of life in deity is separate. And this becomes inconceivable inasmuch as the very power of deity implies unity, implies oneness. We cannot assume of deity as an infinite chaos. We must assume it as an infinite cosmos. And to do this, 
we must bind all the parts together by some over bound, uh, binding of some kind, unity. If it should occur, therefore, that we are substantially one creature, then we can refer to mankind as a being. A being containing many parts, but not divided. Even as our human body is composed of an infinite diversity of living creatures, bound together by the over-consciousness which we call ourselves. But this bond is not conscious in us. It is made possible by autonomic processes, uh, by procedures within our own structure which we are not even aware take place. So in the Vedanta theory, there is one humanity made up of races, made up of social branches, divided into various levels of development, but one. By the same concept, there is one animal creation, of which man is technically a part, bound to it by body, but released from it by the power of individual creative thought. All animals, therefore, must properly be regarded as embodiments of Atma. They, too, have this reality in them. For if it was not there, they could not exist. They could not live. They could not pass through the various simple cycles of existence which distinguish them. They could not be fruitful. They could not have regard for their young. They could not choose their mates. And in the end, they could not creep away and experience death. They have to be part of this one life. This means that in the last analysis, the concept of brotherhood must be extended to all these creatures. St. Francis de Assis recognized this and with the deepest mystical insight referred to his brother the birds and his sisters the flowers. They are one life. And the realization of this could be a tremendous civilizing force if we really know what it means. We have to go further. Minerals. We have to go to the insect kingdoms. We have to go everywhere. For if a thing is it can only exist in a state of being because eternal being sustains it, exists in it, supports it, integrates it, causes its masses to be held together, and prevents its parts from flying into oblivion. So we live in a universe, as the Swami Vivekananda pointed out, in which there is only one life the unity of which is not experienced by most persons. Yet this unity is that which makes, in the last analysis, God and man one. And even still further, performs the ultimate uh, attainment, which is in honor of deity, namely, that in the end, man returns to and becomes one with God or the Atman. <laughs> Thus man is a temporary condition, a stage or step in an eternal program of growth. We cannot properly, therefore, compare God and man. For in one way of looking at it, man is a degree of the waking up of God. And from another way of looking at it, God is a degree of a sleepness locked in corporeal form. We have no contrast here any more than we will later find that we have a vital contrast in good and evil. We have only conditions of being. 
But when the average person thinks of God, he does not think of being, as we may term it philosophically. He thinks of a very personal relationship with space. He feels that it is inhabited by powers bent upon his redemption, and that in some mysterious way he can know the consolation of a personal contract with a personal divinity. Here again, your Eastern philosopher points out that the deeper view is not a loss, but a gain. What do we actually know of the consolation of the presence of God? What do we know of what Brother Lawrence called the practice of the presence of God? To us, we have only our own interpretation of deity as something that exists to come at our summons to bind up the wounds created by our own mistakes. The Easterner doesn't think of it this way, but he points out that this vastness, which might be called the Atman, has another dimension. For after all, it is all, and all must be the greatest and the smallest, the most remote and the most immediate. It must not only be everywhere, it must be here. Therefore, the omnipresent, omniscient deity is not to be regarded as something of an attenuated nature resembling cosmic space or vacuum. It is not a spirit hidden in a void, or something that has to be distilled out of atmosphere. This spirit is actually closer to us than any other part of our own natures, because it is the core. We can never have anything closer to us than our own center. But when we are not in the center, the center seems distant. Again, it is a matter of our own orientation. Consequently, mysticism has never resulted in the strange, cold, detached attitude uh, towards spiritual values that sometimes seem to develop in people as the result of misinterpretation. To St. Francis, this omnipresent power was so close, so intimate, that he could confide in it completely. It knew every part of him. It knew his sorrows, it knew his hopes, his weaknesses. It knew his failings, and by some strange mercifulness within itself, it forgave him. He had no way of really understanding in philosophic terms, it was not his way of life. But he did intuitively sense this tremendous fact that the Atman knows all, that there is only one part of ourselves that can understand us, and that is this core of life. For in this core of life are the laws of our own existence. Here our own being is established. Here every motive, every thought, every emotion, every reflex is in some way known and comprehended. Not perhaps intellectually, as we think of things, but by the mysterious alchemy of identity. This thing which is at the source of us, being all of us, has the power to understand every part of us. It is this understanding which in some way becomes the intuitive guidance, the basis of perhaps our own extrasensory perception. Certainly it is Emerson's oversoul and the anthropos of the Alexandrian Gnosis. It is the man above the man. It is this power which is aware of the man, though the man is not aware either of the power or of himself. 
There we, here we come to another very practical phase of the matter, and that is the contribution that has been made to this theme by Zen and other Buddhistic systems. The Atman is divided from us by a mysterious machinery of thoughts, attitudes, perceptions, reflections, and what are called the aggregates or skandhas. These represent the machine, the carefully built up instrument which was originally designed to help man to know himself. But man, in a moment of extraordinary uh, craftiness, dedicated this machine to the advancement of his own purposes, not the purposes for which the machine was intended. Thus man gained all other things and lost contact with his own nature. This instrument can certainly make him rich because it will give him the skills to create wealth. It can give him the abilities to gratify every reasonable and many unreasonable demands. But the more industriously it is used to advance his material state, the less it is available for its original purpose. So in Zen and Buddhism generally, the point remains that it is this machine that is forever clouding and confusing the issues of life. Man conceals reality by acting contrary to it. First of all, reality is universal. A person, highly personal, cannot experience it because the personal can never experience that which is superior to itself. The more personal we become, therefore, the more we personalize God and the universe and set ourselves up into a very smug little system which is slightly better than idolatry, if any better at all. Actually, therefore, that which performs any destructive action must set up obscuration within its own nature. Anything which holds destructive attitudes uh, which seeks to revenge itself, which strikes back against what it regards to be the injustice of others. Anything that does this strengthens this pattern of personal selfhood. We are hurt because we are offended, and therefore we defend the ego and sacrifice the God. We are ambitious. We are not so much desirous of a good place in the world to come. We want immediate satisfaction. So we sacrifice eternity to a career within a few years of time. We are jealous. Atman is not jealous. But jealousy arises as a result of the conflict of inconsistent patterns within man. A good example of this is to answer a basic question. If Atman is not jealous, how can jealous jealousy exist? All of these faults are secondary patterns. And Kepler tells us the whole story in connection with astronomy. In the, in the development of his astrological speculations, Kepler says very simply, there is no such a thing as a bad planet. There is no such a thing, actually, as a malefic principle in astrology. Yet things move, moving in their proper orbits come into different relationships with each other. Therefore, the planets forming different 
of mechanical, mathematical, chemical patterns become like elements combined in retorts. From their temporary combinations, new secondary substances are created. From the various combinations of eternal principles, known eternal patterns come into existence. Thus came sin and death into the world. They are not primaries. They are the result of various levels of ignorance locked in conflict with each other. And wisdom is the medicine that remedies them all. By this very same principle, therefore, the so-called difficulties which arise in temperaments, which cause us to take various wrong courses of action, all arise from a combination, combination of ignorance and selfness or egotism. These are the causes of trouble. Egotism is the belief that the individual is uniquely divine in the midst of a universe in which there is only one God. Selfishness is the belief that good can come to an individual in a universe in which nature bestows good upon all. And in the efforts that we make to steal good from each other, we make ourselves incapable of experiencing good ourselves. So in the Zen and Buddhist concept, the answer lies in the gradual sublimation of the individual. And his pattern is derived from the nature of the infinite being that he venerates. He would grow, therefore, legitimately by becoming like God. Diogenes once uh, uh, thought this through rather carefully among the Greeks. And having considered the matter carefully as he was walking along the road, he suddenly said to himself, God does not need a staff to lean on. I lean on a staff. This proves that I am not God, because I am dependent. The only way I can become a little more godlike is to throw away the staff. So he did, and hobbled along the road, perhaps less comfortably, but free from one of the crutches of human weakness. It was a symbolical episode, but it points out the principle. Man, in order to achieve the state of Atman, must dispense with those things which are non-Atman, upon which his fascination may be centered to the denial of his eternal birthright. Now, no one suggests that the individual throw away his staff or his dentures. This is not the consideration. The consideration is in consciousness. The individual must gradually attempt to be like the consciousness that he worships. The Master Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. If we love God, we must live according to the life of God, insofar as this is possible. This was the mystic speculation of St. Buenaventura and Santa Teresa. It was the effort to live like the truth which we regard as supreme. We know this truth is everywhere, and that in this truth no living thing is left out. Therefore, in our consciousness, though we cannot be everywhere, we can still include all things in our sense of righteousness. 
we can recognize the unity of life and try to live according to it, remembering always that to the degree that we offend the least of living things, we offend our Father which is in heaven. This leads to the harmless life. And Atman, deity, is the harmless being, where there can be no harm in its nature. We look to deity forever for understanding. The deity will excuse our faults and forgive our limitations. And we have infinite faith that this power, whatever it may be, in its justice, we'll see that no evil befalls us, whether we understand or not. Therefore, as we ask forgiveness, we must practice the concept of the universal benevolence of life that holds no grudge for any reason against anything. To the degree that we can approach this, we approach reality. We actually believe also that deity is eternally concerned with the good of its creation. Therefore, we should be eternally concerned with the well-being of each other. We should guard the natural resources of the earth. We should protect and use wisely everything that we have, because in the great universal power, all things are used with perfect wisdom. Little by little, we can exemplify to some degree these attributes which we regard to be the Atman, at the source of existence and in the heart of ourselves. Buddhism, Vedanta, Yoga, Christian mysticism, the doctrines of the Sufi, and even the witch medicine doctors of our American Indian tribes all held this point in common. That to the degree that we can in unfold our own existence quietly, wisely, lovingly become aware of universal good, to that degree, this Atman, or power within ourselves, comes into manifestation in us. It comes into manifestation when we as persons become like it as principle. It can never manifest in a condition contrary to honor, contrary to ethics, contrary to love, friendship, and peace. Now, this may appear to work a great hardship upon many people who feel that this would lead to very serious misunderstanding. Other people would not believe them to be strong, brave, courageous, self-controlled individuals. They would come to be regarded as weaklings, as failures, as non-entities. Well, let's think it through for a moment. Millions of people today do not believe that God exists. This must be most humiliating to deity, who probably neither knows nor cares. We have given deity a very bad time since the beginning. And if in our ignorance we have perverted truth from the dawn of time, and we try to live truth in our own lives today, others are going to think we are fools. But the simple matter remains, who cares? If we please these other people, we shall be in the same misery they are in. If we keep faith with reality, we will be understood by all who understand the facts. And that is what is really important. So if we must decide whether we find it advantageous uh, to cultivate inner security, we are probably not ready for it. 
But if we ever want to solve the questions, and this goes for the laboratory worker, the scientist, the educator, the religionist, whoever it may be, if we want to answer the great questions, we must remember the thoughtful words of Omar Khayyam. For it is from our own base metals that must be filed the key that will unlock the door of the dervish flouts without. If it is to be done at all, it is to be an experience of the revelation of reality from within. And mystics and saints and sages of all nations, the great teachers of East and West, have described this journey in. This journey which St. John of the Cross describes as the dark night of the soul. The individual seeking reality. And finally discovering the supreme reward for the quest. That is, the experience of identity between man and God. And we have no longer these two contrasting terms. We have the son who has returned to his father's house. For him the banquet is spread. And in this reunion, we for the first time become capable of experiencing the love of God. For love of God must arise from love for God. The love for truth must lead us to truth. The love of eternity must make us citizens of eternity. So in the achievement of our own inner consciousness, illumination, samadhi, what the Buddhist may call the Mahaparinavana. In this achievement, man suddenly becomes one with the Atman, becomes one with the infinite for which there is no second, experiences the final assurance that the divine plan is immutable and everlasting. Until then, he can only believe. But sometime, each one of us will transform or transmute believing into the actual experience of the thing believed. This is the only way in which certainties can come to man. Until then, he must be guided by his faith, inspired by the noble words of his sages and saviors, and impelled a little at a time by his own conscience to the refinement and redemption of his own character. Well, time is up, folks, so I guess that's it for this evening.